Hello everyone, thanks for joining me today for another deep dive into the gospel. If you're joining us for, for the first time today, here at Equip Kingdom, we dig into a selection of verses to learn more about who God is, who we are in Jesus, and how we live in his kingdom. And we're currently studying the gospel according to Luke, and today we're looking at Luke verses, uh, or Luke 11 rather, verses 1 through 13. And Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem at this point, and, and Luke has been presenting Jesus as using situations and interactions that occur along the journey to instruct his disciples. And that happens in today's verses as well, where the disciples come to Jesus and they ask him to teach them how to pray. And before we get started, I would love to pray for you, so I invite you to join me. And and really, my heart today is, is all about how God has set us in families, in his family. And, you know, we're, we're beloved sons and daughters because we are his children. And so, you know, sometimes there are words that, that come from my heart that I, I want to, to bring before the throne on your behalf. But I think today that, that Paul has already done that for us. So I invite you to receive what he already gave us, which is for this reason, we kneel before the Father, from whom every family and on heaven and on earth derives its name. And I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ, and to know that this love surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within you, I pray uh, glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus, throughout all generations, forever and ever, amen. Yes, Lord, amen. Lord, your graciousness, your graciousness in, in bringing us into your family so that we can be one with you. This is a good thing, Lord, and we, we, we revel in it and we take it to, to every chance we get. And of course, Lord, I ask that as we, we study your word today, that you bless the hearing and the reading of this word so that it may equip us to, to go into the world knowing that your kingdom has already come through Jesus, through your Holy Spirit indwelling in us, and that we have to look forward to even more and more with you. I pray that you, you make this manifest in our hearts and in our minds so that we go in faith that you have already gone before us, that you have already uh, buttoned up our past, and that all things that, that come to us have, flown th have flowed through you. And this I pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so last time, of course, we saw how Luke presented two encounters with Jesus. First, he introduces an expert scribe who, who challenged Jesus on the works that lead to salvation. What must I do to gain eternal life? And after the scribe acknowledges that God spoke two commands, to love him wholly, completely, and to love others, the question is then raised as to who is worthy of love. And Jesus responds with the parable of the Good Samaritan, pointing out that fulfilling God's great command to love others is not dependent on who receives love, and that teaching that God desires us to be neighbors and love others, regardless of whether we believe them to be worthy. Remember, it was flipped. Who is my neighbor becomes who must we be a neighbor to. And then after that, Luke then presents Jesus at Martha's house in Bethany. And Martha, you know, she wants to, to be a great hostess to Jesus, and she becomes so distracted by serving Jesus that she misses the point of serving him, which is to love him. And, and the way that you love him is by paying attention to his words and his actions. Remember, we start by listening to Jesus, and then we go and do. And her sister Mary, on the other hand, shows how, uh, how much she loves Jesus by sitting at his feet, absorbing every word that he speaks. And so we can see in both these stories what it means to fulfill the great commandment of God, to love Jesus by listening to him 
and to love others by being a neighbor to everyone. And then today's verses are going to show us a third dimension to that same great commandment, which is how to show love to our Heavenly Father. And, and where we are in the setting is that Jesus is, is traveling to Jerusalem, which we've already noted uh, Luke called the way of salvation. And it's during this journey to the way of salvation where his disciples approach him. Let's go ahead and read the scriptures today. We're going to read Luke 11 verses 1 through 13. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, Whenever you pray, say, Father, let your name be treated as holy. Let your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we also are forgiving everyone being indebted to us. And do not bring us into a temptation. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I say to you, even though he will not, having arisen, give to him because of being his friend, yet because of his shamelessness, he will, having been raised, give to him as much as he needs. Moreover, I myself say to you, keep asking, and it will be given to you. Keep seeking, and you will find. Keep knocking, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who goes on asking receives, and he who goes on seeking finds. And to him who continues knocking, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now Luke starts off by noting that Jesus is praying. And if you've been with us for a while, you know that this always indicates a development in the gospel and a shift in Luke's narrative. And I really think that there are two developments happening here. First, there's a shift that starts where Jesus focuses on encouraging his disciples to pray. To this point, Jesus has withdrawn to, to pray to the Father before certain decisions or encounters. We've seen this time and again. And from this point forward, Jesus will continue to emphasize how the disciples should habitually be seeking the Father for guidance and assistance. So it's not that Jesus stops praying, uh, it's that he's now encouraging his disciples to go and be like him in this regard. Second, this is the first time where the disciples have taken the initiative to ask Jesus for instruction. Um, really, to this point, Jesus has been the one who's determined how and when and what the disciples are learning. So Jesus has shown his followers what it means to be a disciple, what Jesus expects of his disciples, how to serve him on mission, and now he's going to show them what it looks like to love God as God loves. And at some point in the journey, and really we're not given any indication when or where this happens, Jesus is praying. And, and really, there are a number of scenarios you can think here, um, and we don't know whether the disciples have quietly been watching him, or if they approach him after he closes his prayer, or if Jesus returns from a solitary place to where his disciples are. I personally think it's the latter because Jesus regularly retires to a solitary place. So I'm picturing that he comes back from there and the disciples ask him, hey, teach us how to pray. All we know is that after Jesus concludes his prayers, one of his disciples asks him to teach the group how to pray. And this unnamed disciple justifies the ask, pointing to John the baptizer as an example for Jesus to follow. Uh, I don't think that's necessary, but, but, but it does make me think that the disciple who asks is either Andrew or Philip, both of whom were John's disciples before they, they started to follow Jesus. Now the disciple 
is, is coming to Jesus and he's asking Jesus to teach everyone how to pray. But what he's not doing is he's not implying that Jesus' disciples don't know how to pray. Because Jews really have a strong tradition of fixed prayers, including the Shema, which we talked about last week, Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9, most, most um, centrally 4 through 5, which Jews recite twice daily. They also have the 18 benedictions, which were also known as the Amidah or the Shemona Ezrei, which are blessings that are spoken three times daily at synagogue services. And then they also have the Kaddish, which is spoken at the end of each service. So rabbinical writings, although a lot of rabbinical writings come after this time, they do indicate that all of these prayers were common for observant Jews in the first century. So there's, there's a great tradition of having a, a liturgy or fixed prayer to speak before God. Rather, Jesus's disciples here, they, they wanna pray as Jesus prays, given his special relationship with the Father. Basically, they wanna know uh, a prayer that will stand out before God. And, and we know that Jesus, is, that Jesus is always heard by his Father, and so they want that same sort of connection that Jesus has. And Jesus obliges, telling them that whenever they pray, that they should start their prayer by addressing God as Father, as we see in Luke 11, verse two. And he said to them, whenever you pray, say, Father, let your name be treated as holy, let your kingdom come. Now, it is worth noting that in the Didache, which presented the teachings of the apostles, the Lord's Prayer is presented with the instruction to recite it three times per day, just as the Jews recited the 18 benedictions. So that tells me that at least the early church, the apostles, taught it in a similar line to Jewish believers as they would recite the 18 benedictions, so too they should recite um, this Lord's Prayer thrice per day. But I don't believe that Jesus wants his disciples to recite this prayer verbatim. I think what Jesus wants is to provide his disciples with an outline to follow. Because there are elements in this prayer, what we call the Lord's Prayer, that direct our heart posture as we approach God and really to get us thinking about prayer differently. And first thing first, uh, disciples are to set apart before God by addressing him as Father. And, and this is an invitation, right? This is an invitation to begin a conversation with God as children speak to their father. And it's not new that, that, that the Jewish people recognize God as father. Let's go ahead and look at Deuteronomy 32, verse six. Is this the way you repay the Lord, you foolish and unwise people? Is he not your father, your creator, who made you and formed you? Now the context here is that Moses is trying to get the younger gener generation, the younger wilderness generation, to realize that God created and provided for Israel and they're foolish not to follow his commands. So the context here in Deuteronomy is of God as father to the nation of Israel, and that is true. And Jewish prayers recognizing God as provider often recognize God as heavenly father. And we see that with Matthew's version of the prayer, of the Lord's Prayer, which begins with addressing God as our Father in heaven. Now the emphasis here is God's role as Father to Israel to his people in, in Matthew and also in these older prayers, um, these, these liturgy prayers to God. It's, it's God as Father to Israel. But in Luke, Jesus is really introducing a more intimate relationship between father and child. And early on, we see this with Jesus himself as having a very unique relationship with God. Let's look back at Luke 2, verse 49. And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? So where Jesus is unique in referring to God as father, it's as my father. Remember, he called him Abba, which is um, the Aramaic, a very affectionate term for father. And again, as we saw last week, Jesus remarks on his unique privilege when it comes to knowing God as father and being uniquely known by God in Luke 10, verse 22. All things have been committed to me by my father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. 
And I think that verse is really the key to what Jesus is now teaching his disciples about prayer. Because Jesus, the Son of God, alone may choose to reveal the Father, we now see where Jesus has chosen to reveal God to his disciples in a very different way. And you know, John 1 verses 12 to 13 connects Jesus's revelation to the way he invites us to call to God. Let's go ahead and look at John 1. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of a human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. So Jesus' revelation of God as Father, it's redefining our relationship with God. And so what this revelation does here is it brings a spiritual rebirth into God's family. And I think this is why Paul had this revelation. Uh, I mean, I think that's why when he, he talks about Ephesians 3, which is what we talked about earlier, what we, we prayed earlier, um, that he has this revelation in mind that we are reborn into family, God's family. And this is why he prays for the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 3, 14 to 15. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. So Jesus has revealed God's heart for relationship and Ephesians 3 makes it plain that Father wants as many people as possible to be in his family. And so we see this this change that Jesus is bringing by redefining, um, yes, God is Father to all Israel, but God is also our Father who invites us into family. And, and yes, he is the all-powerful creator from whom all things came and for whom we live. Yes, he is vast beyond comprehension and his thoughts and his ways are too great to fully know and understand all that is true. And God wants us to approach him in full trust without any formalities. We don't have to clean ourselves up before we call on our father. Our Father doesn't want us to be anyone other than our most authentic selves when we approach Him. As His children, we are privileged to come before His throne anytime we want to, and I believe that our Father delights in hearing us call to Him. And we're precious to Him. As His children, we have His attention and we enjoy His favor. He dotes on each one of us as his children, and he celebrates every one of our victories, even ones that we're not paying attention to. So at the same time, we have God who is all powerful, all knowing, all seeing, and ever present. He is set apart, and so we should also recognize that he is holy. So Jesus' language here, let your name be treated as holy and sanctified. It acknowledges that God's name reveals his character and his nature. And and really, Jesus is not telling us that, that we're making God's name holy here, okay? It's more like that we have learned the truth about God, and we want the whole world to understand and respect the truth of God's character and nature. And I think that this is also true for the next part of the prayer, let your kingdom come. We're not the ones who are going to bring the kingdom. That's the sole prerogative of God. Plus, the kingdom's already come in the person of Jesus. So we see in in both of these statements that, that God is supremely responsible for making his name holy and for releasing his reign over the earth. And all we have to do is agree and rejoice in the truth of who he is and his promise to bring the whole earth under his benevolent domain. So these words here is is they're an expression of our desire for god to overthrow the kingdom of darkness and we recognize that we're near to that because of jesus's first coming so we see that that when we're praying to god that his name be made holy and that his kingdom come that we're recognizing that it's already underway that god is bringing it more and more to us each day and so we're agreeing with that and we are, are asking it for more. We're asking him for more. We're, long, we're expressing to him that we're longing for more. And I also think that on some level, we're also speaking to this as already accomplished because God's nature never changes, right? He, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And all of God's promises are guaranteed. His yes is our amen, right? 
So where God's name is not yet seen as holy and where darkness still has a stronghold, we're calling into being what is not yet realized. And, and I think that's a part of this. And I think that's an expression of faith. And that is what happens in prayer. So prayers then begin by our understanding of who God is and acknowledging God's authority. And our faith and trust in what he will do for us is based on knowing God as Father and also as Sovereign. And because we know him, we know how to ask according to his good, perfect, and pleasing will. I think this is why repentance had to come first, so that we would know his good, perfect, and pleasing will. So that when we're talking to him, we're talking and connecting with someone who we know. And that's important. And then after this, Jesus says, then you begin to, to make your requests. And the first request that you make is you ask for daily provision, which is what he says next in Luke 11, verse 3. Give us each day our daily bread. Okay, now we're about to have a little fun with this. Um, it's It may not be as straightforward as you think, because the English translation is really little more than an educated guess here, mainly because of one word translated as daily. Now, Luke and the complement in Matthew 6, verse 11, which of course is during the Sermon on the Mount, use a very rare word for daily, which is epiosios. In fact, this word only shows up in the Bible in both versions of the Lord's Prayer. So here in Luke 11, verse 3, and also in Matthew 6, 11, it doesn't show up anywhere else. In the Gospel uh, of Luke and in Acts, Luke's uses, Luke uses other words for daily. So, for instance, when Jesus tells his disciples that they must take up their crosses daily in Luke 9, verse 23, it's a different word. And there, daily is more of a synonymous with a, a lifestyle, a continual, habitual lifestyle. So also when Luke describes in Acts 6, verse 1, how believers in the early church complained that certain widows were being overlooked in their daily distribution of food, daily is a different word, meaning more like day to day. Now, the root for daily here in, in Luke 11, verse 3 is epiosa. It, it actually means the next day or the following day. And that's led several scholars to suggest that Jesus is teaching his disciples to ask God to give tomorrow's bread each day. And as a matter of fact, uh, the early church father, Jerome, who, who we know is the one who translated the Greek Bible into Latin, once quoted the Lord's Prayer from a third source, which is the extra biblical Hebrew gospel, translating this verse as give us today our bread for tomorrow, which I think sounds a little bit strange, don't you? Right? Give us today our bread for tomorrow. Now, as a quick reminder before we go on, I, I'm not speaking this wrong. The, the gospel of Hebrews is not the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is in the Bible. The gospel of the Hebrews is extra biblical. And it was believed to have been written by Matthew, at least some scholars do, uh, separate from his gospel account. And many scholars believe that Luke sourced the Hebrew gospel extensively for the gospel according to Luke. And, and I think based on a lot of that, the early church saw tomorrow's bread as, as more than provision of food. They considered this to be a reference to the consummation of Jesus' kingdom. And they called it the bread of salvation and the bread of life and the heavenly manna. So for them, tomorrow's bread is, is the eternal promise of the consummated kingdom. Recall that Jesus calls himself the bread of life in one of his I am statements in John 6, 48. Um, I really actually want to look at that. Let's go ahead and look at the context of Jesus' self-revelation. We're going to look at John 6, verses 47 to 50. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. Which means that Jesus is the sustenance we receive for eternal life. Asking God then for tomorrow's bread is, is really a request for the grace to live each day as though it's eternity. And, and, Really what this is, is, is how we look at things, right? Because even though we are in this world, which will end, we're not of this world. 
And so ancient Christians saw this prayer as a request for aligning their perspectives with God's kingdom. And in light of that, think about Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 4.18. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So Paul's asking us to look at what's eternal, right? What we can't see. And yes, you can see your daily bread, but you can't always see um, the salvation that we're promised. So Paul's words may be mirroring what Jesus teaches his disciples to ask from God. And it may be that Jesus wants his disciples to acknowledge God's daily faithfulness in providing for their needs, which is more how Matthew's gospel presents the request. And Jesus also wants them to think with an eternal kingdom mindset, which will gu God will guide them toward each day. I think both are possible because both acknowledge the, the disciples' dependence upon the Father, which is always what Jesus is after. And, and beyond asking for provision, whether that's daily or, or eternal, disciples are also to ask the Father for forgiveness from their sins, as we see in Luke 11, verse 4. And forgive us our sins, for we also are forgiving everyone being indebted to us. And do not bring us into a temptation. Okay, this prayer in Luke 11, 4 has three parts. First, disciples recognize that they will continue to sin and fall short of the glory of God, even as they serve him and devote themselves to his purpose. So in humility, disciples petition God to forgive them, not because they deserve his forgiveness, but because they don't want to sin that, that would separate them from the Father, right? Sin by definition separates us from the Father, so we don't want to sin, right? So we're asking God to help us and to forgive us. Like the petition before, in, in asking for forgiveness, there's, there's also an unspoken gratitude for God's graciousness, in this case, to release us from the cost of sin. And that brings us to the second part of the petition, that we also extend this same graciousness to those who sin against us. Recall in Luke 6.36 that, that Jesus expects his disciples to be merciful as their father is merciful. We see again where the prayer is asking God to help disciples transform their thinking to align with his. We begin with repentance so that God can then transform our thinking to align with his, so that we will know his good, perfect, and pleasing will. And, and there is a connection between our willingness to forgive slights and insults and injury that others cause us, whether intentionally or accidentally, and God's willingness to forgive us. In other words, we can't ask God to forgive us if we're unwilling to forgive others. And, and we saw this a lot in Matthew, right? And we saw this illustrated in the parable of the unforgiving servant in Matthew 18. And, and briefly, if you're not familiar with that, uh, God, as the king in the parable, forgives a servant of an astronomical debt. The servant then encounters someone who owes him money, which is a fraction of what the king forgave him. But this first servant refuses to extend to the other person the same grace that he was shown by the king. And when the king learns of this, he orders the servant to be thrown into prison with his debts no longer forgiven. And so the petition shows that, that God's forgiveness cannot be presumed, but comes through repentance that is put into practice. In essence, as disciples, we are conduits of God's compassionate nature. So the forgiveness that we freely receive, we freely give to others to demonstrate God's goodness. And then finally, disciples are to ask the Father not to lead them into temptation. And the Greek word for temptation is the same to test, so there are really two implications here. First, that as disciples are enticed by temptations to sin, that God protects them from being led into situations where they're going to need to be forgiven by God. So the disciples ask God for wisdom and perseverance that they need to avoid being overwhelmed by sin's influence. In other words, God, don't, don't let us go into a place where, where we're going to need rescuing in the first place. And as we talked about in Luke 4, verses 1 to 13, this was the very reason why Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, to demonstrate how to avoid falling prey to sin's power. And if you're with us in that teaching, you'll recall that there are three temptations that are common to humanity. And John talks about these in 1 John 2, 16. 
for everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. Now, Paul tells us that God protects us from being tempted to the point where we would fall away from him, as we see in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So this is one benefit of the petition, that God will guide us away from any temptation that threatens our salvation. And you know, God doesn't tempt anyone, nor does he cause anyone to sin. And James tells us this in James 1, 13 through 15. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. However, God does permit his children's faith to be tested. And James 1 verses 3 and 4 tells us that such testing, it actually brings perseverance. And perseverance brings spiritual maturity, which enables us to overcome what, what, might, what one time might have threatened to overcome us. So this is God strengthening us. And ultimately, this brings us to glory, which is what James tells us in James 1 verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because, having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. And this leads to the second way that we look at this petition. Because the second implication is that the disciple confesses before God that they know their limitations, and so they humbly ask God to limit the testing of their faithfulness. Because God does allow tests to strengthen his believers, and a disciple must be willing to follow God even into a period of testing, as Jesus was in Luke 4. So this petition asks God for his help in avoiding trials that he has not decreed, for rescue from temptations that would be too much to endure, and strength through tests that will build faith. So what we see overall with the Lord's Prayer really is an invitation to connect with God as children who know with confidence that their Father keeps His promises and that He wants His children to trust that they can ask for anything that they need. And to reinforce this, this expectation that, that the disciples should pray with, Jesus introduces a short parable in Luke 11 verses 5 through 8. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I say to you, even though he will not, having arisen, give to him because of being his friend? Yet because of his shamelessness, he will, having been raised, give to him as much as he needs. So in this hypothetical scenario, the disciples and Luke's audience are put into a situation that would have been pretty common for the time. So the scenario is this, that a friend shows up at your door in the middle of the night. Now at that time, and because of the regional climate of, of Israel, People traveled in the evening to avoid the heat of the day. It wasn't done all the time, but it did happen. But in this case, someone shows up at your door and you're not expecting this friend. And when he arrives, you don't have any food to offer him. Well, in the ancient Near East, people typically baked bread for each day. So by midnight, the day's food would have already been eaten. Suffice to say, like there are no grocery stores or convenience marts, so there's no place for this host to go, for you to go, and purchase food. It's the middle of the night. But hospitality was considered an absolute virtue in the ancient Near East culture, and failure to extend hospitality would bring shame to a family. And custom dictated then that the host be able to provide three full loaves of bread for his guest. Anything less which included a broken or a partial, maybe half-eaten loaf, would have been seen as an insult. So Jesus' assumption here is that the host knows that this neighbor has the loaves to spare. And as hard as that may be for us to understand, 
women in that time, they, they typically prepared and baked, baked bread together in a community, especially in uh, smaller villages. So this presumes that, that this host knows that this particular neighbor has the bread, or at least believes that the neighbor has the bread on hand. And so there's, there's no doubt that in, in light of the shame culture and the honor culture that was so prevailing at the time and its importance, that the disciple would do anything possible to feed and shelter his friend, including enlisting a neighbor to help. And the thing about hospitality in this day and age was that it was considered a community responsibility. So if someone asked a neighbor for help, that neighbor would be obligated by the same rules of honor to help the host. So it's almost like the neighbor is also showing hospitality to this guest who shows up in the middle of the night. And, and the request for help is only alone. And the assumption here is that in the morning, the host's wife will bake the loaves to replace the ones that are borrowed here at midnight. And of course the hour's late, right? So the neighbor and his family are fast asleep. And, and homes in the first century, they, they typically only had a single place for sleeping. And the entire family usually slept together and often on the same mat. And the door would have been barred by a, a wooden or an iron bar that was held by rings on a door panel. So, so this big um, piece of wood would have been um, uh, slid through these rings that were attached to the, bo to the bar, to the door on the door panel. So removing the bar and then and and also I think even getting up from where the family's all lying on the same mat would wake up the entire family, right? Everyone in the household would be awake. And and if you can suppose that this particular neighbor has toddlers or, or young children, you know that getting them asleep's a big deal. So we want them to stay asleep, right? But we're we're thinking we're thinking from a Western mindset. But for this neighbor in this hypothetical situation, it's just too much to get up and help even though the host considers the neighbor his friend. Basically, the neighbor doesn't want to disrupt his household to help his friend. And I get that it may be harder for us to understand the urgency of the host here, but really from an Eastern perspective, the neighbor is, is really offering a ridiculous excuse. But it's more than clear to us in this example that, that the friendship between the two is not as valuable to the neighbor as peace and quiet in his house. So that is not, the friendship's not gonna be what gets the neighbor up and, and wakes up his toddlers and, and, and wakes up everyone in the household. However, there is more at stake for this neighbor as well, as I've just already said, because honor trumps everything in, in ancient Near East culture, and this is no exception. And where I think we might have this reverse is it's, it's the neighbor that's acting shamelessly by refusing to honor hospitality. And this neighbor knows that there is no other consequence than losing honor. And that honor is gonna be lost among the entire community. Because once the news of this neighbor's snub makes its way through the village and it's not gonna take long, the neighbor may well be ostracized from the rest of the community. And that would include even attending synagogue. Like this is a big deal. And it's for this reason alone, the neighbor acquiesces and provides the loaves of bread. Now, you may have noticed that, that I didn't put this in, in the NIV as we typically go uh, with, because the more modern translations tend to attribute shamelessness to the host who is pounding on the door in the middle of the night. But that's a Western mindset. And those listening to Jesus would not have considered any of the host's actions as rude or off-putting. The neighbor is the only one who's acting contrary to expectations. And I can prove it to you. Let's look all the way back at Proverbs uh, 3, verses 27 to 28. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due, when it is in your power to act. Do not say to your neighbor, come back tomorrow and I'll give it to you, when you already have it with you. So you see, we even see evidence from scripture, right? That, that the neighbor, the expectation for the neighbor is to open that door. So in this parable, Jesus has already told the disciples that they are the hosts who, who petition their neighbor for something they need. And that means that, that this is placing God in, in a parallel with the neighbor. However, Jesus is presenting God as contrary to the neighbor. He's not like him, he's, he's the opposite of this neighbor. Because unlike the neighbor, God doesn't sleep, right? Um, 
Unlike the neighbor, God will never turn away from us. Uh, he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. So we don't have to worry that he's going to, to refuse us anything. And unlike the neighbor, God doesn't keep the door to heaven shut before us. So if the neighbor who is so self-absorbed that he is ready to disregard friendship will nonetheless get up because he wants to save face, how much more can the disciples depend on God to be gracious when they make bold requests in prayer to him? I mean, God has sent his son to reveal himself to the disciples. So what is Jesus revealing? He's revealing that God is our father who's going to nurture relationships with his children. And that means he's going to be responsive to his children. And God's name is at stake here. And so he's going to act faithfully to his promises. In other words, the disciples can be bold in asking God for help because he, he acts for the sake of his holy name. So, so just as the, the neighbor uh, is concerned about um, preserving his reputation, so God will remain who he always is. And if God is faithful and says that he, he will always be with us, that he, will, that he will provide for us, that we don't have to worry about that. And so the, the disciples should boldly engage with their gracious, faithful father on a continuous, habitual basis. And that means that a disciple's life should be centered around asking questions, seeking responses, and knocking on doors that lead to the Father's favor and promises, as Jesus encourages in Luke 11 verses 9 to 10. Moreover, I myself say to you, keep asking and it will be given to you. Keep seeking and you will find. Keep knocking and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who goes on asking receives, and he who goes on seeking finds, and to him who continues knocking, the door will be opened. You know, when Jesus starts off by saying, I say to you, sometimes he says, truly I say to you, he's speaking from divine authority here. And I think there's more to it because I have to believe that he's also speaking from his experience as God's beloved son and chosen servant. I think Jesus is saying, you can trust me here as one who has experienced this truth firsthand and has experienced this truth longer than creation. So if you keep on asking, the Father will give you what you need. If you keep on seeking, you will find what your heart desires. And if you keep knocking at the doors to heaven, heaven will be open to you. And, and asking is an invitation to pray, right? And to pray continually. And Paul tells us that this is a fundamental duty and privilege of believers. In 1 Thessalonians 5.17, he says, pray continually, because that is God's will for us in Jesus. And, and what, have we, what are we talking about here? What is prayer? It's a conversation. And it's a conversation between two individuals who love one another. If, if you are in relationship with God, you talk with him. And that's all that prayer is here. And God wants you to bring your authentic self to him. He doesn't need you to speak like I speak. He doesn't need you to speak as your pastor speaks. He wants you to speak as you speak. And he's going to speak back to you in your language. And, and you should know God is never bothered by your requests. Because Peter encourages us that there are no requests too big or too small for us to bring to God. In 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And Paul tells us that prayer is the antidote to worry in Philippians 4 verses 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And they're seeking. And, and seeking is an invitation to pursue God and his kingdom and his righteousness. God promises that we will find him when we pursue him wholeheartedly. And we see this promise really throughout the Bible. Uh, we see this from Moses teaching the younger wilderness generation in Deuteronomy 4.29, all the way to the prophet Jeremiah encouraging people who are about to be exiled. And we see this in Jeremiah 29 verses 12 to 13. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I think it's interesting that, that Jesus isn't actually telling them anything new. Um, 
because all of this has already been said what he's presenting is is how we look at ourselves in relation to the father that's what's new and and so we've we've talked about this a lot right how how jesus is the one who interprets god's word for us in the old testament so that's what he's doing now and he's doing and he's teaching his disciples he's teaching us to do this by seeing god as our our affectionate doting loving father who is all powerful right who 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 is the creator of heaven and earth who is a uh, king and lord over everything yet is so close to us that he never leaves us that he listens to every word that we say that he bends his ear from heaven to hear us that's what's new and we also know that that jesus presented seeking god's kingdom and his righteousness as the way to avoid worrying about basic needs in matthew 6 33. So what we're seeing here is that seeking, it hones our focus, right? We're not supposed to be worried about our needs because God takes care of meeting our needs. What we should instead do is seek his presence and advance his plans, right? It's, it's a flip. Don't worry about what he's already promised to us and has been promising to us and has been faithful to provide for us. Instead, set your mind on things above and seek his presence seek his kingdom seek his righteousness advance his kingdom that's what he says that we need to refocus so this in other words seeking here is a recalibration and i think knocking is another invitation it is an invitation to come into god's favor and blessing and jesus had just told a parable where the door was locked and he contrasts that here with god because God's not going to lock the door to his provision. He's not going to lock the door to his blessings or his favor. So for the, the elect who persevere, Jesus promises that the door to heaven will remain open no matter what. And he tells the church this. It's the church at um, Philadelphia in, in Revelation 3 verse 8. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name now the early church saw themselves as knocking on the door to salvation the door remained open to those who sought the narrow way which actually luke presents as a door in luke 13 but that door will will shut to those who fail to respond to the gospel of jesus so for those disciples who are bold in prayer and persistent in seeking god and his favor Jesus promises that their efforts will be rewarded. Our Father desires to respond to our faith with good gifts. And so Jesus next talks about um, what that looks like. And he wants his disciples to think in terms of what answered prayers look like. So he compares answered prayer to how a father provides food for his children in Luke 11 verses 11 to 13. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead. Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, similar to, an earlier, to the earlier parable, uh, Jesus is putting the disciples directly into the story, and therefore we are directly into the story. Now we do know from extra biblical accounts that, that Peter had children, so he could identify as a father. And whether the other disciples had children or not, none of them could imagine serving their children a snake when the, their children asked for a fish. And really it's unthinkable to swap out a scorpion for an egg, right? So in the first case, the switch is not at all what the child wants. Um, I should note that the word for snake that's here in the Greek is not a, a venomous snake, um, but still. So it's not a dangerous situation, but still nobody would f uh, serve their child a, a snake if they wanted fish. And in the second, the switch endangers the child altogether because scorpions are venomous. Now on a deeper level, I think we can also see this as Jesus already having compared snakes and scorpions to evil, which we see in Luke 10 verse 19. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. So if if snake and scorpion are, are representing evil in Luke 10, 19, then here they also represent this malice or evil response as a response to a child's trusting request. And no father who loves his children will be so heartless. 
and God, who loves his children, is neither cruel nor capricious. God is never going to give evil as a response to a request for good. He's not evil. He can't do evil. And, and that also means that if we ask for something that's outside of the will of God, we don't have to worry about getting what we asked for, right? You got right what you asked for, even if that would harm us. Because he's a good father, God wisely chooses us to give us what's best for us. God's discretion here is a part of the calculation. Now, if even evil, evil fathers, and I think when he says, if you who are evil, he's, he's really insinuating that only God is good. So even you who fall short of that, if even you respond to your children's requests with good food, then disciples can be completely confident that God will be even more gracious with his gifts. And, and God gives more than what we ask for. As a matter of fact, immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. So even when we are asking for basic necessities, God also gives us himself. And even when we're asking for protection from temptation, God indwells through his spirit so that we're never apart from him. And so what Jesus is doing is he's revealing even more information about the father here, and he's doing it for the first time. Because to this point, Luke has presented Holy Spirit only in relation to John the baptizer. Remember that, um, that he was prompt, that Zechariah was promised that the Holy Spirit would be on John the baptizer even before John's born, and then also to Jesus, who also always has his spirit. And certainly when the disciples are sent on mission, they're empowered by the Holy Spirit. But what Jesus is saying now is he's now revealing that, that God's promise, it includes his presence with that same authority and that same power that they had on mission, and it's intended for them to receive in perpetuity. It's coming. So this is a prophecy, what Jesus is saying here. And so we know, of course, that the Holy Spirit um, is going to come as the Father's good gift at Pentecost after Jesus ascends back to the Father. So on the one hand, Jesus is prophesying this is a good gift to come. However, the gift of the Holy Spirit also manifests in God's answer to prayer. And we know this because James 1.17 tells us that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father in heaven. And it comes through his Spirit, right? Because God is Spirit. So we may pray in confidence that no matter what we ask for, we may be assured that God blesses us from his store, his his treasures of heavenly riches. And that means that God's answers to our prayers are designed to meet all of our needs. Material, of course, but even better than that, spiritual. And spiritual needs are our eternal needs. And so when we ask God for things, he's, he's meeting not only what we need in the moment, what we need for today, but also tomorrow's needs, those eternal needs. Ooh, that's fun, isn't it? Well, that's the Lord's Prayer, and, and that's all we're going to do for today. When we pick up next time, we find Jesus being accused of aligning himself with evil, which is incredible given what he's just talked about today, where, where God is only good. And what this does is it sets up a contrast between revelation and judgment. And of course, it's all about, based on how we respond to Jesus. Thank you for joining me, my friends. I, as always, I am so happy that you you choose to to spend your time seeking god with me um that that together i think that we make up a community that that god sees and and i think he's blessing that so i pray uh that you receive even more than than you can ask or imagine uh even what was even what i asked for in in today's lesson that you receive even more for it maybe there's a word that god is giving you that he wants you to to dig in deeper and and i i tell you go expecting him to respond to that until next time friends know that i'm praying for you and that i ask that god bless you in all your needs both material and spiritual take care friends bye bye